Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would help me now to pour gospel gasoline on Brian's message and on the others that have gone before. My heart's desire has been that every message when we didn't know what each other would say would fit together for these brothers and sisters in a way that would be powerful for moving them into the most fruitful, faithful ministries possible. And so I pray that I would be faithful now to your word, that you would grant me a voice, and that you would grant them ears to hear and hearts to be sensitive and responsive to whatever truth is spoken. So come now and glorify Christ and strengthen our faith and intensify our affections for you and advance your mission through the ministries represented here and call to yourself those who are not far from the kingdom but are not in it. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So my title is A Hunger for God, A Foundation for Faithful and Effective Ministry. Now, whether or not a hunger for God is a foundation, an essential foundation for a faithful and effective ministry will depend on what you believe the goal of ministry is. If you believe, as I do, and I'll try to show you, that the goal of ministry is the all-satisfying gladness of your people's hearts in the glory of Christ, or in all that God is for them in Christ, then it will follow that your joy in Christ is an essential foundation for that ministry. And if that's true, if your joy in Christ is essential for leading others to an all-satisfying joy in Christ, then it follows that a hunger for Christ or a hunger for God is an essential foundation for Christian ministry that's effective and faithful. So that's the reasoning. We could, we could turn it upside down and start and say, the Bible says we should have a hunger for God and therefore if you have a hunger for God, you'll be satisfied in God and if you're satisfied in God, you'll be equipped to lead others to be satisfied in God and that will be the aim of your ministry and you will uh, a led a faithful and effective ministry. But I'm not going to go that direction. I'm, I am going to go the direction I started. We're going to start with what's the goal of ministry? And then we're going to move to in order to have an effective ministry, you have to embrace that goal in your own soul. And then we go beneath that to a hunger for God. And so I invite you to uh, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. 2 Corinthians 1, 24. And we're going to read 1, 24 through maybe verse 4 of chapter 2 and see this remarkable statement. It has been so influential in my understanding of my own ministry over the years. It's just so helpful to have crystal clear apostolic statements about what you're supposed to try to do in the ministry. Because there's just a thousand things you're told to do as you read magazines and books and you, it becomes very overwhelming and discouraging at times. And to hear a clear biblical statement can just 
cause all the cobwebs to get cleared up and clear vision to happen. So one of those is verse 24 of chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy. For you stand firm in your faith. So that's what I'm going to come back to. We work with you for your joy. That was Paul's clear apostolic goal in his ministry. I am working with you so that you will have joy. That's what I think pastors should do. That's what a faithful and effective ministry aspires to. And then he grounds it and explains it. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. So I don't want to undermine your joy with pain. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad? But the one whom I have pained. And I clearly don't want to be sad, so I don't want to do that. Verse 3. And I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice, for I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Now that is an amazing five verses. Absolutely amazing. Who talks like that? Well, someone talks like that when they have a very clear goal for their ministry, namely to make others happy in God and it has gotten down into the very fiber of their being, so they talk like this. So, my main goal for all of you is that you will embrace verse 24 as your functional mission statement. You don't have to put it on your card or wall, but that it function that way for you. I work with my people for their Joy. That's what I do morning, noon, and night. Every sermon I prepare, every wedding homily I give, every funeral meditation I give, every staff devotion I lead, I am targeting their soul for greater joy in God. That's what I'm about. And if I see them drifting off into other kinds of superior joys in their life, I'm on them because I want them to have superior joy in God. Because Paul said that was his goal, and I want it to be mine, and I want it to be yours. And believe me, your people want it to be yours, although they, they're not quite sure of that sometimes. Because they have their joys that aren't necessarily these, which we'll get to in a minute. So this is the apostolic goal. I work with you for your joy. Now, this was not a cheap goal for Paul. So many people, when you start talking about joy, they start having light thoughts, not heavy thoughts. All my thoughts about joy are heavy, so heavy they must crush me to the ground. Because life is hell. And therefore, to talk about joy in it is absurd. It's just wild, it's crazy, it's supernatural, it's off the charts, unrealistic. There's nothing frivolous or light about it. So to, to give you a feel of this, now this is, this is Paul talking about what his goal was for all of those to whom he ministered. I work with you for your joy. What did it cost him? This, this book, 2 Corinthians Corinthians has in it more of those testimonies than any of the other books. And, and here's the one from a little later in the book, chapter 11, verse 23 following. It goes like this. Are they, these, these super apostles, are they servants of Christ? 
I'm a better one. He's talking like a madman. He said, excuse me, I'm going to play the madman for a little while. That's what he said. I am I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, countless beatings. He couldn't even remember how many times he'd been beaten. I tell you, if I were beaten one time, I'd remember it, it was one. And then if it was two, I'd remember two. If it was three, I'd keep a record. He just stopped keeping a record. Picture it. How you doing? You had any beatings recently? <laughs> or, or are you just whining because of some other kind of difficulty? Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. 39 lashes five times, same back. Don't you love this man? I love the Apostle Paul. Three times I was beaten with rods. That must have been especially bad because you, you remembered them. The others were countless, countless beatings. <laughs> Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brethren, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. It was costly to work for their joy. So please, if you start having light, breezy, airy, fluttery thoughts, as you hear me say, your goal in ministry is to labor for the joy of your people, just know I have that in mind. That's what it will cost you because we're talking about a very particular kind of joy here that has a particular kind of fruit, some of which you heard in the last hour. We are workers with you for your joy. So it wasn't cheap. That's the first thing I wanna say about it. It wasn't cheap. And next thing I wanna say about it is that it was not an off the cuff psychological sop that you kind of throw out to wimpy readers who have such soft, tender feelings, they need to be constantly comforted, or he really is after us for our joy. And if you don't keep telling them how, how wonderful Christianity is, they're gonna run away. It wasn't, it wasn't that either. It wasn't that he was throwing it to them as a kind of sop to keep them happy. It comes from somewhere very, very deep inside Paul so deep inside Paul that it, when he opens his mouth and just starts talking about a relationship with them, it affects the way he talks about it in a most peculiar way. That's why I read on into ver chapter two, verses one to four, because that's what I have in mind here. So let's look at that. How does this passion to live for their joy work for their joy affect the way he even thinks and talks about his relationship with them. It's verses one and two. Watch him. For I made up my mind, since I'm working for your joy, that's my goal, I made up my mind not to make <clears throat> another painful visit to you. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? In other words, one of the reasons I work for your joy is that your joy is my joy. You agree with that paraphrase? Do you see that? I don't want to cause you pain because if I ruin your joy, who is there 
to make me glad, make me glad. Since I'm finding joy in your joy, if I ruin your joy, my joy's going down. So the first, the first thing that's kind of bubbling up out of him is, I'm after your joy because your joy is my joy. That's amazing. A lot of people would shy away from talking like that. Think it sounds selfish or something. How could that be selfish? I want you to be happy because when you're happy, I'm happy. Nobody would look at you and say, yeah, you're always trying to be happy. <laughs> you're just using me. You're using me. I'm not using you. Your happiness makes me happy. I'm not using you. Or, verse 3, as, and I wrote as I did so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice, for I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. Oh. Oh. So it works the other way too. So in verse 2, he doesn't want to mess up their joy because theirs is his, and thus he doesn't want to mess up his. And now he says at the end of verse 3, my joy is the joy of you all. I just felt so completely sure that if I had joy, you would have joy. Amazing. This is a man for whom the pursuit of joy in the lives of others and the pursuit of fullness of joy in himself, in their joy, is so deeply rooted, it just, it just flows out in the most remarkable way as he talks about their relationship. What makes you glad makes me glad. What makes me glad makes you glad. And then in verse 4, he puts a name on that. There's a name for that. Verse 4. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. That's the name of it. What is love in Paul's vocabulary? I, I love to just read Paul's stories of love. This is one. And then fill in the definition of love from the stories. And my definition here would be love between a people is a relationship when you're increasing in joy makes mine go big. And when my increasing in joy makes yours go big, we call that love. That's what love is. When your joy is my joy, and my joy is your joy, and we're out to increase each other's joy for our own joy, because when yours goes up, mine goes up. When mine goes up, your goes up. And this is a glorious spiral together as we fight for each other's joy. That's love in Paul's understanding. So when Paul works for their joy, he is working for what makes him glad and he is loving them. I want you to know about the love that I have for you. That is why I speak to you as I do. Now, that's an, a flyover of the text. If you step back from it, you say, that's just pure sentimentalism. I mean, it's just pure, naturalistic sentimentalism, right? Sentimentality is all that. I mean, any, any natural, unbelieving group on the planet has a mutual admiration society where one person, everybody's happy, everybody's happy. You're happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, you're happy, cool. There's nothing Christ-exalting, there's no gospel in it, there's no holiness in it, there's no spirituality in it, there's nothing supernatural about it. It's just pure sentimentality. 
or is it? We, we have left out something really, really important. And what we've left out is the beginning and the ending of verse 24. So we need to go back and get this thing fixed. Because so far, we haven't talked about distinctive Christian anything. There's nothing distinctively Christian in anything I've said so far. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your, and you would have expected him to say faith. I would have. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy. For you stand firm in your faith. Okay, now we got a sandwich. And the two pieces of bread here are faith, and in the middle is joy. And it surprises me. And I ask, what are you saying? Why did you substitute faith there? Why didn't you say, not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your faith, for you stand firm in your faith. Why did you substitute joy in there? Well... What he means by joy is the joy of faith, evidently. So now we're starting to make it Christian, okay? We're going to make it Christian. We're going to make it gospel. We're going to make it Pauline. We're going to make it biblical because that's what it is. Not that we lord it over. We're not, we're not as a pastor, lording it over our people's faith. We're coming alongside for joy of faith. There is a peculiar kind of joy being talked about here, the joy of faith. And if you ask me, why are you using that little of phrase? Where'd you get that? And I'll tell you where I got it. I got it from Philippians 1.25. Because the only other place in Paul's writings where he describes his apostolic mission as joy is Philippians 1.25. You, you remember the context. Paul is struggling with whether to die and go to be with Christ or whether to remain behind and serve the church. He wants to die and be with Christ because that's far better and yet it's more useful for the church and so I'll probably stay behind. And the way he articulates that is like this. This is Philippians 1.23-25. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all. Here comes for your progress and joy of faith. Now that's as breathtaking to me as 2 Corinthians 1.24. In 2 Corinthians 1.24, he says, I work with you for your joy. And here he says, I remain on planet earth for the joy of your faith. So this joy that Paul is so passionate to live for, I'm, gonna, I'm staying out of heaven for this, is the joy of faith. What does that mean? What kind of genitive is that? <laughs> I get a clue from Jesus' language about faith in John 6, 35. See if you think this helps. It does me. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. This is John 6, 35. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. Now, aren't those parallel? 
coming so as not to hunger, believing so as not to thirst. So I'm bread and I'm water. Living bread, living water. So come eat, be satisfied with your soul. Come drink, be satisfied. Only he didn't say come in the second phrase, second pair. He said, believe. So I say, okay, believing then in Jesus' mind is a soul, not a physical, but a soul coming to bread, a soul coming to a fountain so as to eat and drink to the satisfaction of the soul so that all other satisfactions become secondary and this one is now totally dominant. That's what believing is. You know, John 1, 12, to as many as, as received him, who believed, received, believed, received, believed, like that. Received him as what? Water, bread. Lord, treasure, Savior, all that God is for us in Jesus, faith receives, takes in, embraces, enjoys, rests in, cleaves to, is satisfied by. So when he says joy of faith, that's no surprise to me. That's the Joy of embracing Jesus as the all-satisfying water. Joy of embracing Jesus as the all-satisfying bread. The joy of embracing Jesus as the pearl of great price. And on and on. We embrace the glorious deity of Christ. That's what faith does and delights in it. Faith embraces the humble, sinless, virgin-born humanity of Christ. It embraces it and rests in it, is satisfied by it. Faith embraces the miracle-working, universe-creating power of Christ. Faith embraces the covenant-keeping, law-fulfilling, righteousness-performing, perfection-providing, death and obedience of Jesus Christ. The wrath-bearing, justice-satisfying, sin-atoning death of Jesus' faith, joyfully says, yes, 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 this is what I want, this is what I need, this is the treasure of my life, the death-defeating, devil-destroying, heaven-opening resurrection of Jesus, the sovereign, interceding, ever-present, never leaving us alone, kingship of Jesus, and the list just goes on and on. This is what the joy of faith is. It is the receiving, the welcoming, the drinking, the eating of the bread and the water, which is all of Christ or all that God is for us in Christ. That's what faith is. Now, if that's true, if, that's, if we're on to something here with the phrase, not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy of all that believing, for you stand firm in that believing with all that joy. Now we have a Christian text. Now we don't have a mutual admiration society. We have something very, very different. When I say to you now, your joy is my joy, I mean when you find full satisfaction in magnifying Christ, I find satisfaction in you. And when you watch me find my joy in the supremacy of Christ, you find satisfaction in me. And it all becomes Christ exalting. Because my joy in you is because of your joy in Christ. And your joy in me is because of my joy in Christ. And that's called Christian love. Not natural, sentimental, mutual admiration society. And I had this pressed on me big time in recent weeks. I got two more weeks as pastor of Bethlehem. My last, my last sermon is Easter Sunday. I'll be done, 30 33 years almost. So I've been watching these people love me. I love my people. And here's, but here's the strange thing. Lots of you are in smaller churches. Some of you are in middle-sized, bigger churches. I just want to encourage you in something here. For, 
for the last several months, virtually every service, I preach three times on the weekend, somebody will come up to me, they'll take my hand, they'll pause, they get teary-eyed, and they say, I may not, I may not be able to get to you at your farewell service in April. I just want to tell you, thank you. Thank you. And sometimes that's all I can say, and they walk away. But here's the amazing thing. I don't know them. I don't know who they are. Sometimes they'll let me off the hook, and they'll just say, I've never met you. I've been here eight years. Really? I've never met you. My wife and I have been here eight years at the North Campus. And I just want to tell you, we've never been the same. And if we hadn't come here, I wouldn't know what to do when we lost our daughter. Now, what, I, I have to say stuff. what is that? What is that? That, that? What is that emotion? They don't know me. I don't know who they are. We have no personal relationship. And they're crying in front of me out of gratitude. What is that? I'll tell you what it is. It's love. And it's a love that is built on shared valuing of Jesus week in and week out in the same room. You don't even have to know a person's name. If you see each other back and forth, he's valuing Jesus. He's talking about the preciousness of my Jesus. And they're soaking that in and they're loving Jesus. And all this is, this is going up and like this, deep things happen in the human soul relationally. They really do. It's amazing to watch it happen. So be encouraged that if, if you don't know your people as well as you'd like to, you can still love them well, and remarkably deep things can happen over time between a well-fed people. Your joy is my joy now means when you find your supreme gladness in Christ, I find gladness in you. And my joy is your joy now means when I find my supreme gladness in Christ, you find your gladness in me. That's the aim of Paul's ministry. I work with you for your joy, specifically the joy of faith. That is the joy of embracing Christ as your supreme treasure. That's why I live. I want you to have your joy in Christ. And so he's pouring himself out for that. It is not a cheap goal, as I said. It's not a Christian sop thrown psychologically to the needy people in the congregation. It is rooted deep, deep, deep down in Paul's grasp of what the gospel is and who he is and what the purpose of ministry is. And he needs to say to them, and this is another step, that this is a very dangerous goal in ministry. It's a very, very dangerous goal. If anybody hears you say that your goal for the church is the joy of the church, and they say, well, only a... <laughs> middle-class, well-to-do, persecution-free American pastor could talk like that. You just look him right in the eye and say, you do not know what you are talking about. When I work with you for your joy, I am not pampering you. I am preparing you to suffer. My whole goal in preparing my people to have supreme pleasure in Christ is so that they won't lose their pleasure when they lose everything but Christ. And I do look back with some sense of sweet gratification 
on the number of testimonies in my church that got that and walked through horrible things with joy. So it's a very dangerous calling. We, we're not, if you were to agree with me that you should go home now and make it your lifelong ambition to work with your people for their joy, you wouldn't be spoiling them in luxury. You would be preparing them for suffering. My wife and I bought a series of DVDs produced by the website chinasoul.org. And the title of the series was called The Cross, Jesus in China. And the first one is called The Spring of Life. The next is called The Seeds of Blood. And the next is called The Bitter Cup. And we watched them together. It's about the church flourishing in China over the last 40, 50 years through suffering. And we came away with one overwhelming impression. The abiding theme running through all of those DVDs was joy, joy, joy. And it seemed as though the old people you know, little whiskers and just old, <laughs> who, had, who had suffered the longest, spoke in the most endearing, tender, almost palpable terms about the sweetness of the presence of Jesus and the joy of faith in their suffering. I don't claim to have suffered in my ministry. Nothing by way of comparison to what Christians in history have or what they have. And so I'm always trying to test my exegetical conclusions with reality so that I speak of it with some sense of living truth instead of just biblical theory and watching these Chinese Christians testify to the durable, unwavering joy of the Lord in the midst of suffering heartened my own sense of, yes, we're onto something here. We work with our people for their joy so that when the China comes and they're in jail for 20 years, separated from their wife and kids unjustly, they don't spend their whole time kicking the wall with where's God. We Americans are so ready to get in God's face when things don't go well. It didn't enter their mind to get in God's face. God was all they had. So, it's not a pampering of your people to tell them, I'm going to work with you for your joy. It's a preparing of your people to suffer. Now, this might be a good point in the message to ask, why did Paul not say in verse 24 of chapter 1, we work with you for your love? And the reason I say that <coughs> is because I'm aware that when I say, the, let the goal of your ministry be the, the Christ-exalting, soul-satisfying, mission-advancing joy of your people, somebody could come back to me and quote several important texts where the goal of Paul's ministry was love, like 1 Timothy 1.15, I mean 1.5. The aim of our charge is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. We're aiming to get you to be loving people. And that would be absolutely right. I'm not going to nullify any verses in the Bible. So I come back when I hear a voice like that over in First Timothy. I say, why, why did he say 
I work with you for your joy. Don't you want to say love? Don't you want to, I mean, say the, the real goal is, is others. And my answer to why at this point he said joy instead of love is because if you have loving the world and loving people and all the fruits of love that you want your people to have, let your light so shine before men that they may see your, your loving good works and give glory to your Father. Yes, yes, yes. If you try to make that a goal and you're always on your people, do those good works. Love people. Love, love, love. Do those good works. And you, you do an end run around massive, heart-altering joy in Jesus as Jesus, three bad things are going to happen. One is that the root of love will be taken away. Nobody will sustain authentic love for the world who's not profoundly satisfied in Jesus. Secondly, you take the gift of love away. What do you have to give to anybody if you don't have joy in Jesus? What are you going to give them? A full belly? The ability to read? Then hell? The only way we can authentically love people is to impart to them a soul satisfaction in Jesus that never ends forever. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. If you don't have that to give to people, you don't love them ultimately. Just play in social games. It's a big burden of mine these days that evangelicals say to the world, we care about all suffering, especially eternal suffering. And so if you don't have a gift for that, then you've thrown away the capacity to love them. So if you try to do an end run to love as the goal around joy in Jesus, satisfaction in Jesus, you're going to get here. What are you going to give them? And the third thing it loses is the spirit of love. Do you feel more loved? when somebody does a good thing for you begrudgingly or joyfully? A good thing, a good thing. They do a good thing for you. And in one case, they do it begrudgingly. I don't want to do it, but you're supposed to do it, so I'll do it. And the other one is, I, I would love to do this for you. It would make my day. In which of those do you feel more loved? And if you try to do an end run around deep, pervasive, soul-satisfying joy in Jesus in order to get your people to love, you'll wind up with a duty-driven, legal, joyless, hard-working people. Let me give you an example of how this works for love in 2 Corinthians over in the 8th chapter. I love this text. It convicts me to the roots and fills me with longing for the way I would love to be and the way I would like to influence the church to be. So this is Paul using the example of the Macedonian believers as an example for how the Corinthians should be lovingly generous. How does he do it? We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. That is just glorious. So look at the three pieces that Grace came down. I want you to know about the grace of God. So almighty, sovereign grace came down among the churches in Macedonia and did something supernatural. 
That's number one. Number two, what did it do? It caused abundance of joy, verse two. But what makes the joy so stunning is that it's sandwiched with affliction on this side and poverty on this side. In a severe test of affliction, your abundance of joy and extreme poverty. So that's step two. Grace comes down, sovereign grace, in the preaching of the gospel, God comes and he stuns these souls broad awake. Your sins are forgiven, hell is shut, heaven is open, you're justified, your sins are taken away, you have the Holy Spirit, you're on your way to glory, and they believed it so deeply, they were overflowing, it says, overflowing with joy, and, and their affliction was increasing. Through many tribulations, you must enter the kingdom, and their poverty hadn't gone away, which means their joy was not based on their freedom from afflictions, and their joy was not based on their freedom from poverty. Their joy was based on the grace that had united them to Christ and satisfied their souls in Him, which thirdly led to generosity, which is what is called love later in verse 7. Your abundance of joy overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. So, if you ask Paul, why did you, why did you say that joy was the goal of your ministry in 124 and not love? I think he'd point you to verse 2 of 2 Corinthians 8 and said, that's what happens. That's what happens. If, if joy is strong enough in Christ, if satisfaction goes deep enough in all that God is for you in Christ, afflictions won't be daunting, poverty won't be daunting, and you will overflow with ministry to the poor. But if I try to do an end run around joy, I'll create social agencies and Christ will get no glory. Christ gets glory from us when he satisfies our soul more than the absence of afflictions and more than the presence of wealth. Now, let me go back to where we began, see if I can land this. I, I developed a logic. I said, if the goal of ministry is the joy of believers in all that God is for them in Jesus, then it will follow that our joy in Jesus as pastors is an essential foundation for that ministry. And I think those first two steps in the logic have been demonstrated from this text. Verse 24 demonstrates the first one, we work with you for your joy. That's the goal of the ministry. And the, the fact that I must share that joy is demonstrated in the way Paul unpacks it, verses 2 and 3. Your joy is my joy, and my joy is your joy. It was inconceivable for Paul that he could minister other people's joy in God if he had none himself. It was absolutely inconceivable. And it's always been that way in the ministry, hasn't it? Psalm 40, verse 3, he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. He put a new song in my mouth. Many will see and put their trust in the Lord. That's the way the ministry works. I have the joy, they go to God. Or... Psalm 51, 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Restore to me the joy of my salvation so sinners will go to you. It's the way it works. So level two in the logic of this message, yes, yes. I must 
find my satisfaction in Christ if I am to point people to Christ as the all-satisfying treasure of the universe. That's the nature of the ministry. One of the favorite verses on that is Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them, let the leaders, let the pastors do this with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. I love that. It takes a happy pastor to be a helpful pastor. It will be of no advantage to the people if the pastor is groaning over his ministry. I don't want to do this, but I got to do it. It's how I make my living. But rather, I love my God. I love his word. I love my people. There are burdens many, but I love what I do. This is joy to me to find them finding joy in God through my words. That makes a healthy people, according to Hebrews 13, 17, which leads us now to our last third level in the, in the logic. If, if the aim of ministry is to help people find their satisfaction in the supreme value and beauty of Jesus, then our satisfaction must be an essential foundation of that ministry which now leads to the bottom and deeper than that there must be therefore a hunger for God or Jesus because where there's no hunger for what you're eating there's no pleasure in the eating is there if you have no taste for what you're putting in your mouth, you're not going to say, mmm, that's good. You're just going to swallow it like a vitamin or spinach or something. <laughs> Which means that an essential foundation for a faithful and effective ministry, in fact, is a hunger. For God, listen to Peter. After saying, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, namely the Holy Spirit, by the living and awarding, through the living and abiding word of God, that is the gospel, he says, just keep going, remove the chapter division, like newborn infants, desire, epipotheo, strong desire, desire the spiritual milk, you're like babies that have just been born and you're rooting until you find the milk in you. That's what babies do in their lives. The new birth produces desire. I want the milk of the word. But here's the way the verse really reads. Like newborn infants desire the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up to salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. And if you haven't, you won't desire him. There won't be an all satisfying embrace of Jesus as the supreme treasure and value of the world if down here there hasn't been awakened a taste and see that he is good, more to be desired than anything in the world. That's called the new birth. Pretty radical. And I don't mean to imply anything too strong, like genuine born-again people don't go up and down in their desires. We do. We do. Which is why we fight for this every 
day, which is why the psalmist cry out, as a deer pants for the flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God, Psalm 42. Or Psalm 63, God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where no water is. That's, that's the voice of a man who has tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And for the time being, he's not getting all he needs and all he wants. He's crying. He's seeking. He's running for the brook. You do that every day. Do you do that every day? The foundation of your ministry is a hunger for God. Above that, the foundation for your ministry is being satisfied in all that God is for you in Jesus. And the goal of that ministry is to help those people go there. Help those people go there. All your life, give yourself to that. To bring this people from loving the world, being satisfied in the world, until they put all that to death and embrace Jesus as their all-satisfying treasure. That's your goal in the ministry, is to help them get there. I close by letting John put it all together, or Jesus in John 7, 37. If anyone thirsts, if anyone thirsts, that is, if anyone has a true hunger for God or Christ, let him come to me and drink. Let him find his hunger satisfied in me. Whoever believes in me, it's the joy of faith. It's the coming of faith. It's the satisfaction, the drinking, the hungering of faith. If anyone believes in me, out of his heart will flow for his people rivers of living water. There it is. Pastor, do you have a thirst? Do you have a hunger for God? Meaning nothing. Nothing, nothing can quench this but God. No television series can quench it. No wife can quench it. No children can quench it. No job, no preaching, no books can quench it. Only one thing, the living God experienced by the Holy Spirit in his word, walking with him daily. He is my bread. He is my fountain. If you have that hunger, then you will begin to grow in your satisfaction in him, and that will become a river, a river of living water, and your people will drink from that. They'll drink for decades from that. And oh, the strength that it will give them and the freedom from the love of this world. So give yourself to that with all of your heart. Father, I pray that we would turn away from anything that competes with you and that in all the legitimate joys of life, you would be the joy of our joys. I pray that you would come and grant any in this room who has not tasted and seen, savored, that the Lord is good to taste tonight. And don't ever let that taste go out. Just keep throwing on it more and more goodness until it becomes a, an addiction for God. And then, Lord, grant that the people who are served by the leaders in this room, grant that they would be served this way. May we all go home and resolve in new ways. I work with you for your joy. To that end, preserve our hunger, I pray, in you alone. In Jesus' name. Before we stand to respond, I want to give you just a moment there at your seat to reflect, to pray for just a moment. What well are you drinking from?